Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it is, wherever it is you are. My name is Zach Godfrey, and I guess I'm your U.S. history teacher. The last time we talked, we talked about Texas annexation. I said we would cover Texas annexation in two parts. The first part was the revolution of Texas, the revolution of the Lone Star State against a newly formed independent Mexican nation. I'm going to adjust that a little bit, and we're going to do it in three parts. Part two was supposed to be the Mexican-American War, but before we cover the Mexican-American War, I want to go over a few things that was going on in Washington, D.C. over that period of 10 or 15 years during the Texas Revolution to kind of give you a, a, a clearer picture of exactly what was going on in America that led to the annexation of Texas. And that's going to take us uh, from Andrew Jackson's second term all the way to uh, President James K. Polk who would be the president during the Mexican-American War. We're going to do it like we've been doing it. I'm going to give you um, all the information in the lecture. I'm going to tell you where to go to Clever to supplement that information. I'm going to break the lecture down into parts. You'll write the topics of the part on the left side of your notes, and then you will summarize, explain um, the main idea, uh, the key information of all those topics on the right side. You'll wrap it up in a summary, and then I'll tell you something to do in addition on Edsby uh, a little bit later. So here we go. Today's lesson, transition of power from Jackson all the way to James K. Polk. Big picture, how did Texas become a state? Annexation of Texas. Before we start, I'm going to tell you to go to chapter 12, lesson 3 of the Jefferson book by logging into Clever. That's the section that most parallels the lecture you're going to hear today. In addition, there are some lesson resources that are super cool that you can look at to uh, enhance the experience of the lecture. There's going to be stuff about Jackson and the National Bank. There's going to be some political cartoons criticizing Jackson, comparing him to a tyrant and showing him ripping up the Constitution. There is going to be a, a map of the electoral votes from the election of uh, 1836, I believe. We'll go over that specifically. Yeah, 1836, in which Andrew Jackson did not run and his vice president, Martin Van Buren, ran. And it shows you... Um, the popularity per region that led to Martin Van Buren winning the presidency. And then we'll even see a political cartoon making fun of Martin Van Buren during what we will learn about uh, the Panic of 1837, uh, an economic crisis that America experienced in the 1830s that's going to you know, dictate the government and, and some of the things that we experience in our nation. Okay, so the lecture is going to start. The lecture starting three, two, one, right now. Here is topic number one. Topic number one is Jackson's second term, Jackson and the bank. This is more of a big picture category topic. It's not the first time you've heard this. You know, Jackson's a man of the people, uh, Mr. Common Folk. He hates the banks. He hates the banks. He thinks the banks are unfair. He thinks the banks represent all the um, rich businessmen up north, you know, in this systemic economic oppression of rich people versus poor people. So he's very anti-bank. In addition, he considers himself to be like a, a leader of the pioneers, a leader of the westward expansion movement. Uh, he also went from the Carolinas to Tennessee, so he, he participated in the westward expansion. A lot of people that wanted to expand west, what do you need to expand west? You need resources. And so if you're a poor person, you need money. Where do you get money? You get money from a bank. And they felt like uh, the, sh the rules were too strict, too unfair, and too you know, top-down as far as giving the rich and powerful control versus the poor people who wanted access to money so they could expand and move west. So overall, topic number one, uh, Jackson doesn't like the National Bank. He's not the first Southerner or Westerner not to. If you go back to Thomas Jefferson, a Southerner didn't like the National Bank. That was a big part of the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton. Jackson does not like the National Bank. At this point in time, we're already at the second National Bank, by the way, which was created um, with the American system, which I believe was proposed by Henry Clay, Silver Tongue Fox. Okay, cool. That's topic one. <clears throat> topic one. Okay, topic two is what I call 
Jackson versus his enemies. His enemies. So who are his enemies? Well, he has many enemies. He's a very polarizing guy. But uh, today, his enemies will specifically be Henry Clay, who we've known about, you know, talked about all the way leading up to him being a war hawk of the War of 1812, and Daniel Webster. And Daniel Webster's role in American government is he will kind of uh, be a focal leader of federal supremacy over states' rights. So we've got two candidates, Clay, not candidates, but two politicians, Clay and Webster. They're more in support of federal supremacy, uh, and they're just kind of making Andrew Jackson's life more difficult uh, because they don't get along. We're political adversaries. So what they want to do is they know that Andrew Jackson is going to run for president again. Uh, I believe he's going to run for president. Uh, is that 30, 32? I'll, I'll put some notes on that on the end. But he's going to run for president for his second term. And they have a strategy that they believe will um, make him look very unpopular and embarrass him in front of the people and lead to him not being elected for his second term. And their strategy focuses on the National Bank. At the time, the president of the National Bank, his name is Nicholas Biddle. And uh, the bank's charter was going to expire. So basically, his contract with the government it was going to expire, but it wasn't going to expire before the election. It was going to expire after the election. So they didn't have to do anything at the moment. But they said, you know, some people really like the National Bank, and the National Bank's really important. So why don't we apply? They told Nicholas Biddle. They said, hey, Nicholas Biddle, apply for a charter extension before it expires and we'll do it before the election. Jackson will have to shut it down. People are going to go, that's crazy. We need the National Bank. They're going to go, Jackson's a crazy person. He's not a good uh, candidate to be president. Uh, he won't be elected for a second term. That's their plan to attack Andrew Jackson. So again, this topic is Andrew Jackson versus his enemies. His enemies in this particular topic are Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, Nicholas Biddle. They're going to extend the charter of the National Bank, put it in front of the president, who will be forced to either accept it or veto it. Uh, they believe he will veto it, and they believe if he vetoes it, it'll be so unpopular that there's no way he will win election for his second term. He's going to kill the bank. That is topic two, Jackson versus his enemies. <laughs> Hope you guys are having a good day. Went for a few walks with my dog today. I know you don't care. Okay, topic three. Here we go. Topic three, election of 1836. So what Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and Nicholas Biddle didn't seem to understand is that Jackson had his, what they call, fingers on the pulse of the common man. He was much more connected to what they believed and how they felt about these issues uh, than, than Clay and his companions were. And the people didn't like the bank. Most common folks at the time heard that the bank charter wasn't extended, and they go, okay, cool. They didn't care. They didn't care at all. And so, obviously, Jackson is going to win the presidency. He is then going to personally take it upon him to, to destroy the National Bank even before its charter expires. He takes all the federal government's money out of the National Bank. He puts it in deposits in various state banks and private banks across the country. And then when the charter is up for renewal, essentially it's contract with the government, he doesn't extend it. And so that's it. At that moment, the National Bank is destroyed. Uh, Jackson wins the election of 1836. He destroys the National Bank and he puts the nation's money in a bunch of different state banks and private banks all over the country. And that's what he did. He's not going to run for a third term. So he's not going to run in the election of um, 1842. Or no, 1840, I'm sorry. That's his vice president, Martin Van Buren, will win that election. What is happening in addition to all of this is, is he's really beloved by his followers, but the other Americans that don't support him they kind of united in a anti-Jackson group, and this anti-Jackson group has created a new political party. And they're going to essentially become more popular in the short term than the fading uh, Republican Party that was the extension of the Democratic Republican Party that was created by Jefferson 
and you know, and then Jackson created the Democratic Party, and there was some political confusion with that. The next political party to compete with Jackson's Democrats are they're called the Whigs, and not because of their hair. Um, it's an homage to a British political party uh, where they believed they were pro-parliament, anti-monarchy. And so the Whigs believe that Congress uh, is the, the group of people that truly represent the American people and that the power of the government should be in Congress, not in the president. They thought that Jackson had made the presidency too strong and became a tyrant, and they kind of ran on this political platform that the power of the federal government should be in Congress, the legislative branch, not in the executive branch with the president. So that is topic three, election of 1836. Uh, Jackson destroys the bank, and Martin Van Buren becomes president. I want to emphasize a few things. I have made a few mistakes as far as when the elections are held and who becomes president when. The election of 1836 is when Martin Van Buren will become president. So that means Andrew Jackson won the election of 1832 and the election of 1828. Jackson won the election of 1828, 1832. His vice president, Martin Van Buren, will win the election of 1836. Sorry about the errors early in the election. Okay. Topic four, panic. Woo that's, that's me being panicked. Panic of 1837. Uh, panic is scary. It's a crisis. Uh, it's not good. There's no national bank anymore. Jackson killed it. He destroyed it. He moved its money in all kinds of different private banks and state banks all over the country. Its charter expired, and it doesn't exist anymore. It wasn't good had a very negative impact on the nation and the nation's economy. When it was uh, all in one place, when all the loans and stuff were centralized in the National Bank, there was more uh, uniformity across the nation in regards to standards that you would have to follow to take out loans and things of that nature. When you distributed to a bunch of different banks all over the country, all these different banks had different motivations. One of the things that you started to see happen is that banks were just giving away money and loans and banknotes all willy-nilly. And so the people were using those loans, buying land predominantly, but other things. So there was more money in the, in the market. There was also uh, confusion as to what the value of money was. And so this led to inflation. This led to the decreased value of the dollar. And this led to people being able to um, pay off their loans, keep their jobs, so on and so forth. So there's economic chaos. Economic chaos. That Andrew Jackson is essentially directly responsible for, but he doesn't have to deal with because he stepped down after his second term and essentially just hand that off to Martin Van Buren, who was his vice president. Uh, so yeah, that's bad. It's not going well for Martin Van Buren in his first term. He's only going to be a first termer. It's, uh, it's not good. It's not good for Mr. Martin Van Buren. All right, now one good thing he did do is eventually he creates this thing called the National Treasury. And he's like, okay, we got to stop keeping uh, our money all over these state banks and stuff like that. The federal government needs at least one place where its money goes and we dictate, you know, loan values and stuff. And he created the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Treasury. But that, that really wasn't enough to prevent the, uh, the Panic of 1837. That was really after the fact. So the Panic of 1837 will essentially result in Martin Van Buren being a very unpopular president and kind of a stain on Jackson's presidency as well, obviously. And so that's the Panic of 1837, and that was Topic 4. Okay, we're, we're cooking with gas. This one's going pretty fast, and I'm happy with it. Okay, Topic 5. Topic 5 is Rise of the Whig Party. Rise of the Whig Party, I told you earlier, I told you earlier that one of the results of Andrew Jackson's um, power and success as president is that the people that really didn't like him, they unified against him. And they were very anti him and his followers, and they, they call themselves the Whigs. So Martin Van Buren, he's president. He's an extension of Jackson. He creates the treasury. That's not enough to, to fix the financial crisis of the Panic of 1837. So now there's going to be a new presidential election. And what is that going to be? Let me look at my notes real quick. So that's the election of 1836. So this is going to be the election of 1840. You're going to have uh, 
the Whigs are going to nominate, and this is kind of interesting, William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison, we know he was a general all the way back to the War of 1812. He's responsible for beating Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippy Canoe, essentially defeating the Native American Confederation that will help the U.S. win the War of 1812. He is going to run against Martin Van Buren. Obviously, Van Buren's the incumbent. Van Buren was already president. Remember, Van Buren was Jackson's vice president. So you got the new, this new party putting a candidate out there, William Henry Harrison, famous guy, famous general, successful general, Mike Jackson. And you have Martin Van Buren and the Democrats, the, the, the group that's already had power. Uh, Van Buren is kind of an extension of the Jackson era because, again, he was Jackson's vice president and he's a Democrat. The Whigs had kind of seen the popularity of Jackson and some of his political strategy. This whole, you know, plain folks, what you learn in civics, this whole relating to the normal person and the, and the normal person being like, you know what, I want my political leader to be somebody I could hang out with, not somebody I feel like I, uh, I can't associate with that wouldn't relate to me. And so the Whigs try to play off that and they try to portray William Henry Harrison as a soldier and a guy who like hangs out in his log cabin and stuff like that. And the Democrats, were, they try to make fun of the whole log cabin thing. They're like, no, he's just a, uh, 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 the son of a rich guy who sits around and waits for his military pensions in a log cabin. Regardless, this is going to be known as the log cabin campaign. The Whigs will play on the, the whole log cabin thing, and they'll, they'll connect with the identity. Obviously, the Panic of 1837 put a bad taste in everybody's mouth about Van Buren. And William Henry Harrison, General William Henry Harrison, you know, the guy that beat Tecumseh at Tippecanoe, he will win the election of 1840. He will be a Whig president. Um, and that's, we're almost done with topic five, almost done with topic five, Rise of the Whigs. Here's the thing, though, with William Henry Harrison. When he became president on the date of his inauguration, it was like really cold and really windy and stuff like that. It was not a good day in Washington, D.C. And they were like, hey, you know, Mr. Newly Elected President, Maybe give your inauguration speech like inside today, since the weather's like super bad. And he was like, I'm William Henry Harrison. I don't know if he said that, but I'm assuming he said that. He's like, I'm William Henry Harrison. I'm going to give my inauguration outside because I'm going to talk to the people. And he did. He went, he went outside. He gave his inauguration outside. He died 32 days later um, of pneumonia. And his vice president... John Tyler will become president. And that's very important to remember William Henry Harrison, the Whig, dies 32 days or so after his inauguration and his vice president, John Tyler, will become the president and not William Henry Harrison, obviously, because he's, he's deceased. He's no longer with us. Okay, that was topic five, the Whigs, rise of the Whigs. Okay, topic six. John Tyler's presidency. John Tyler was from Virginia. All right, now if we go back and we look at a map and stuff like that, and we divide the map north and south and west with all the regions, and we look at where are the Democrats popular, where are the Republicans popular, we know that the Democrats have the South. And the, at one point in time, the Republicans had the North. The Republicans are now the Whigs. They have the North. All right, but there's not, there's more Southerners and Westerners maybe at this point than there are Northerners. So the Whig Party needs to connect to the South. And one of the reasons they selected John Tyler is because he's a man of the South. He's from Virginia. So they put him on the, on the ballot, hoping that, you know, they'd get enough Southern response that that would be enough to get William Henry Harrison in the office. And they were right, and William Henry Harrison becomes president, but he dies. So now John Tyler is president. Well, John Tyler's political policies aren't very Whig-like. In fact, after he becomes president, it's pretty easy to identify him. He's not a Whig at all. And he vetoes, like, all the Whig bills. Like, all the bills that the Whigs push through Congress that go to the president. When you would assume, you know, let's take modern day politics. You've got President Trump. Let's say President Trump and the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate. If the House, then to the Senate, passes a bill to the president, it's Republican to Republican to Republican, you would think that the Republican president would pass whatever law that his Republican Congress put through. Let's parallel the title. Whig House, Whig Senate, Whig President. Nope, I'm going to veto my own party's laws. So it showed right off the bat he wasn't a team player. 
eventually, during his presidency, he's actually going to get kicked out of the Whig Party. Um, it shows there's a lack of cohesion amongst the Whigs, that this is a political moment uh, where it was important for them to exist, uh, but it's probably not going to be a long-lasting political party because their main unifying factor was just anti-Jackson. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's John Tyler's presidency. So you can make a prediction uh, if he's going to be elected again. And the prediction is going to be no, because obviously his own party is not going to nominate him to run. They kicked him out, and he's not really a Democrat because he ran as a Whig. So that's, that's it for John Tyler's presidency. Not a great presidency. It would have been interesting to see what the, the war hero William Henry Harrison did as president. But we'll never know because he died. Topic 6. That was topic 6. John Tyler's president. <clears throat> this is our last topic of the day, by the way. I hope you've been on Jefferson Text Chapter 12, Lesson 3 the whole time, so you can be looking at those lesson resources or just following along in the text as I follow along with you in my lecture. It's a good way to supplement this information. This is Topic 7. Make sure you take in your notes. Make sure you write your summary after this. Here we go. Last topic of the day, Topic 7. Topic 7, Topic 7. Election of 1844 is Topic 7. You've got the Whigs. They still exist. They're divided by region. Henry Clay is kind of the leader of the Whigs. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's never quite risen to the, the precipice of the presidency, which is his goal the whole time. But he's been a very, very prominent political mover and shaker, again, since he was a war off leading up to the War of 1812. So he's going to win the nomination for the Whigs. He's going to replace John Tyler. He's going to run for president. Then we've got this guy. I don't know if you've ever been to Lakeland, but his name is, uh, that's Lakeland's in Polk County. This guy's name is James K. Polk. And he's going to run for the Democrats. He's going to run again. That's Jackson's party. Their political identity is still kind of the same. They're the party of the common people, the southern people. They're the manifest destiny party. James K. Polk is going to run on like a manifest destiny platform. He's basically going to like commit to the American people that if you elect me, I'm going to get you Texas. It's going to become a state. If you elect me, I'm going to get you California. It's going to become a state. He's also kind of anti-government. Similar to Jackson, he, he makes a commitment of, of a one-term presidency. He says, if you elect me also, I promise I'm only going to do a one-term. I'm not in here for power. And uh, that's that's... That's a popular, popular, popular platform to run with, and he gets elected. He wins the election of 1844. Uh, that the Whigs are out of power already. Goes back to the Democrats, back to Jackson's power. This time it's James K. Polk. And why did I do today's lesson today instead of jumping right to the Mexican-American War? Well, here's why. Andrew Jackson and then Martin Van, Martin Van Buren and then eventually John Tyler, they're not able to grant... Texas annexation. Uh, Texas can't get their statehood because of the Missouri Compromise. But the attitudes are changing. By the time we get to Polk, more Americans north and top are, are very pro-manifest destiny. And, and Polk is going to approve the annexation of Texas, and that will lead to the Mexican-American War, which will be tomorrow's time. Now, one of the reasons he's able to annex Texas, and it's just a small side note, but we need to know this, is remember, you have the Missouri Compromise, same amount of states, north, south, free, slave, with the exception of Missouri, which is above that line. Well, if we're going to add Texas, we need to add something in the north. By this time, uh, we had kind of agreed to the border with Canada and Great Britain, and we annexed Oregon. So Oregon will be annexed in the north under James K. Polk. Texas will be annexed in the south under James K. Polk. And the annexation of Texas, the process of Texas becoming a state, is going to directly lead us into the Mexican-American War, which we will cover tomorrow. That's one of my favorite things in American history. Guys, this was uh, Andrew Jackson's enemies. This was the gap in between the Texas Revolution and the Mexican-American War. This was a lot of fun. Write your summary. Check Edsby. I love you guys very much. Do some learning. Read a book. Physically move your body. See ya.